everyone. Uh, today we are going to turn our attention to one-dimensional kinematics, an exciting time for all that's involved, uh, mostly because it explains how the world works in one dimension. And this is the fundamental mathematics that we're going to use to kind of explain the details of the physics that we see going forward. Uh, and so the idea of kinematics is the study of motion. Kini is uh, a Greek word like kinesis. It just means um, motion. And then matics is, I guess, the word that we tack on to mean we're studying something. And we focus uh, beginning on one dimension because uh, the neat thing about our world is that that's kind of all we need to do just uh, for separate dimensions, at least to get started in physics. Uh, and the basics that we'll engage in here is to start by identifying the position of an object. And again, we're using the particle model, so these are sort of zero-dimensional uh, thing. And we note that the position of that particle is a function of time. So we indicate that as uh, x to indicate its position, and then t to indicate the time. And so this is sort of illustrating uh, what we like to call a motion diagram. And it sort of illustrates, uh, just gives us a tool to get going. It's kind of like a still a snapshot of a movie at, of a particle stacked on top of each other. And so it shows the locations of a particle as it's moving. And each of these time intervals in this kind of schematic diagram is uh, fixed. Uh, so we kind of see it slowing down over time where these little intervals uh, come to stop. So the particle is moving to the right and then coming to a stop. And so we use this little bit of a motion diagram as ability to just kind of sketch things out and illustrate the points that we mean. Uh, so we define its position as the location of a particle relative to the origin. And so we'll often indicate that t and give it a time that's a zero to indicate it's the first one. And it goes on to infinity. So uh, the displacement of a particle is the measurement of the differences in positions, which are measured relative to the origin, uh, at different times. And we always construct our vectors here as a final minus an initial. And so this little diagram here is showing the displacement from t0 to t1. And so this is the position of the final minus the position of the initial. So the vector is what is able to connect uh, these uh, two particles together. If I take the initial, I add this vector to it, I get the final. Uh, so this works as a vector. We'll do it later in two dimensions and three dimensions, but for now, this is what we mean by the displacement. We will also sometimes talk about the distance, and the distance represents the sum of the magnitude of a bunch of the at little displacements, which is a nice way of saying it's just the total distance that the particle travels. So if that's the origin and my particle swings out to the right and then comes back to the left, then what happens is we call the full path trajectory the distance traveled, and then the displacement measured from the origin is just measured from zero to wherever the particle is now. So the displacement can sort of grow and shrink, but the distance is always increasing or staying the same uh, as it travels along. We'll also often describe these kinds of motions in terms of these x versus t graphs. Uh, so the x is representing the position, and then the t is the time moving forward. And so this is the x versus t graph for this particle right here. And you can sort of see the behavior. It sort of starts out at x equals zero. It speeds up. It uh, sort of sails to the right at a constant speed, comes to a stop, turns around, comes to the back and then comes to uh, comes back to the middle and then comes to a stop. And so we get this nice x versus t graph that represents our uh, time there. And it is in this x versus t graph that we start to explore the notions of kinematics because we can come up with ideas to describe how fast a particle is moving. And we do that by describing this in terms of the average velocity of the particle. And the average velocity is the average, uh, or it represents the interval uh, of a displacement. So it's a displacement 
in a time interval. So it's the x final minus the initial over the time intervals. And so we can interpret that geometrically in terms of the slope of a line between two points on this graph, one at x final t final, that's right here, and one at x initial t initial, that's right here. And so the slope between these two points here represents the average velocity. And so that will give a sort of a value of delta x over delta t, which means a small change in position over a small change of time. In terms of math, we often call this curve the secant curve. It kind of cuts through uh, the curve between two points. And we'll use that in contrast with something we'll call the tangent curve to the curve a little bit later. So the average velocity is this change in displacement over a period in time. The average speed is that distance, that always increasing value divided by the same period of time. So here is a diagram where the average velocity for this particle going from t equals zero to one, it goes up to some position and then comes back. That average velocity is zero. The displacement is zero, so the, uh, the time is one, uh, the time interval is one. So that gives you a velocity of zero. The speed is a lot harder to calculate because we have to calculate the full length of this curve, which requires some serious calculus, uh, and then divide that by the time interval. And so we don't know what the speed is, but the velocity is zero. So often the velocity is, uh, the average velocity is easier to calculate than the average speed. And we can use uh, some of our intuition uh, in these graphs. If this is a position versus time graph, I can ask questions of which uh, object has the largest speed. And if you sort of stare at it, you think, oh, okay, uh, this A here, the red one, is the fast object, and B is the slower object. And the way we look at these straight line curves is between any points on them, I can measure the change in displacement, say here from time equals one to three, has a change of three meters in a time interval of two seconds. And so we express the, that as 1.5 meters per second. And the slow piece here goes from say zero to three, that's three seconds, and in that time it traverses two meters. And so that's a speed of 0.67 meters per second. So what this means is, okay, we can actually measure the speeds off here. And you can look at these and you think, wait, I've, I've done this. This is the rise over run of a curve. And so those are the slopes of these lines here. And so the velocity is the slope of the line, and everywhere along here, the velocities of these objects are going to be the same. But that's not necessarily true for all objects. In fact, for any our previous uh, curve here, it had this weird position versus time shape. And so the actual average velocities that you measure really depend on the two points here. And it doesn't quite capture the velocity of the object at any given point. So instead, what we do is we think about this in the context of uh, the slope of this curve at a single point uh, here, and we call that the tangent point here. And the way we think about that is, well, what if we calculate the average velocity over progressively smaller and smaller time intervals around this point. We shrink up that uh, average velocity interval to be smaller and smaller until it's just measuring it right there at that single point. And so that gives us this idea that uh, we have a tangent point on uh, this curve. And then the slope of the line that just touches the curve of that point is going to represent the, the velocity of the particle. Now, we think about this in context of this operator here. This is called a limit. And the limit means that as this sort of time interval gets smaller and smaller and smaller, it uh, is going to get a better and better approximation of what we call the instantaneous velocity. And so we write that instead of the limit uh, of the delta x over delta t, we use this notation 
dx by dt, which means a tiny change in distance divided by a tiny change in time right here at this point. And we call that, invoking the language of calculus, a derivative of the curve at that point. Now, some of you have probably taken calculus, and this is all like, okay, I've heard this before. And some of you may have not taken calculus. And for that point, I am going to suggest that you go ahead and you check out uh, some videos by uh, Grant Sanderson uh, of 3 Blue 1 Brown that gives you a little bit of an intuitive description of what calculus is. I know that everybody is co-enrolled in calculus and this is all going to be filled out for you over the first few weeks of the term, but we're going to need some calculus now just to get started in physics and you're going to become progressively more and more familiar with it. So if this seems completely crazy and foreign or you've not really comfortable with it, even if you've heard about it, don't worry. You're going to get a lot more fill that kind of builds and develops up these ideas over the next few weeks. So don't worry about that for now. I'm just getting the privilege of telling you it for the first time, but it will not in any way be the last. Okay, so we have the idea of an instantaneous velocity. We can also look at this thing that's called the acceleration. And the acceleration is the change in velocity over a time interval. And the average is over a finite time difference. And then we can carry out this limit again and get uh, the idea of an instantaneous acceleration at, a an, at an infinitesimally small time interval. And so that's just the limit of delta V over delta T as delta T goes to zero. And that is the slope of the velocity curve. And then for reasons that you're going to explore a lot more in calculus, it's equal to the curvature or what I like to call the concavity of the position versus time curve. So let's look at this kind of graphically and what it means. Here's an X versus T curve for a bunch of uh, points uh, or a particle moving through time. And so what we can see here is we see the curve in red and I can look at a position when it crosses the x equals zero axis at some time. At this point, the curve is moving upward here. And so the slope is positive. And so we say that the velocity of the particle is positive at this point. Up here at the top, we see that the slope of the curve is zero. So it's coming, uh, the position is coming to a stop and then turning around. And that corresponds to right at the top, that tangent point, your speed or your velocity is going to be zero. Uh, and so it's going to turn around. And in fact, your velocity is going to be increasing up to here. And that's going to stop. And then as you turn around and go the other way, the slope becomes negative, And then your, your particle turns around and is going back in the negative x direction. And then finally down here, we have the slope is negative. It's sort of moving towards um, uh, the larger, ne uh, neg more negative x values, so the velocity is, uh, is zero, and then it kind of flattens out to zero. The other thing I want to call your attention to is the curvature here. And so if it's sort of like an, uh, it starts out with it sort of curving upward, and so this means that the slope is getting larger as I move along the curve. So it's kind of the slope of the slope, or the change in the slope. And so it sort of shows up as this kind of uh, curving upward. At this point, that line kind of looks like a straight line. And that means that the slope isn't increasing. And in fact, the slope starts to decrease as I move across x equals zero. And that's what I mean by the curvature kind of changing and sort of tilting the other way. And this corresponds to the acceleration being less than zero. And so from this x equals zero point over to about here, the curvature is negative, and so the acceleration is negative. And that's because the slope is getting smaller. So the slope gets larger as we go along here. When we reach this point, it kind of reaches a maximum slope, and then it starts to decrease again. And so that's what we see when we're looking at the curvature and the acceleration of the particle. So the acceleration is zero here, and then the curvature is negative uh, through here. And then here, the slope is, uh, is negative, 
and it is slowly becoming more positive, tending towards zero. And so that means that the curvature is going to be greater than zero and the acceleration is greater than zero. Okay, so that's kind of graphically what we want to illustrate. Mathematically, we have kind of more requirements here. Uh, and we're going to adopt the language of calculus here. And so this is a very brief introduction to calculus. Uh, so we will often um, write out uh, these terms in terms of the calculus operations uh, and hope that that gives you the sort of pieces that you uh, need and can graft your mathematical knowledge onto uh, in order to help you do the physics. So first off, you should be aware that calculus is developed to answer these problems. Like the first calculus problems were kinematics problems. It's become applied to a lot more, but right now this tells us how the world moves. And uh, we use this calculus notation uh, by sort of saying what I said before, which the velocity is dx by dt, sort of how we would say it. We will often also write this as a little operator. Uh, where it's d by dt, which means take the change in position with respect to time. And velocity is the time derivative of position. That's often what we'll say. So velocity is d by dt, or the time derivative of a particle's position. Similarly, acceleration is the time derivative of velocity. And if we think about this as an operator, we will often write this at dx by dt is the v, and so the acceleration is d, the d by dt, or the time derivative of dx by dt. And so we'll write that often using this notation where we kind of square the operator. It's a weird notion, but it's d squared x by dt squared. And so linguistically, we say that we say the acceleration is the second time derivative of position. So that gives us the, just the words that we're going to talk about and how we're going to express these things. But the, uh, practically what this means is it says take the position and take two time derivatives of it. We'll actually talk mechanically about how you do that in a few slides, but right now I'm just trying to set up the language. All right, so the first mathematical tool is that derivatives are what mathematicians like to call linear. And linear means that if I have a combination of two functions, f of t and g of t, multiplied by just constants, which means like numbers, uh, a, big A and big B, that I can take a time derivative operator and kind of pass it in and apply it to F and G separately, and then I pull the constants out front. Uh, and so the you know, we basically say, okay, this is A times DF by TT plus B times DG by DT. So we'll use that tool occasionally. Uh, it's very useful to have. Um, the next is that products of functions follow a special rule. And that is if I take a time derivative of a product of two functions, the first thing I do is I write down uh, the first function and I take the derivative of the second, and then I add to that the second function times the derivative of the first. And so the important thing is that I just don't take the derivative of both functions and multiply them together. I have to do this, what we they call the product rule, which is one thing gets a derivative times the original other thing, and then you do the derivative applied to the other thing. And so you need those two separate terms. So we'll illustrate all of these things as we go, uh, as we move along. Okay. The one rule that we're going to need to know mechanically on how to do things right now is that the derivative of a function that's called a power law follows a specific form. And so that is the time derivative of a constant times t to the n is n, whatever the power is, times the constant times t to the n minus one, where I subtract one from the constant that I'm doing the derivative of. And so that gives me um, uh, just, it basically takes one power away. So here's a couple examples. And so if I say, all right, this is a position function, three t to the fourth, I can calculate the time derivative of it by taking d by dt of this, and I look at it and I say the power is four, so I pull one power down and I multiply it by the constant in front, so it's four times three, and I subtract one from that power, and that gives me the t 
uh, t4 minus t minus 1 is t cubed. And so the time derivative of 3t to the fourth, 12t cubed. Okay, good. We can do this for non-integer exponents as well. And we can apply that linear operator as well. So if I take d by dt of this whole expression, 2t squared minus 3t to the minus 1 half, I apply the time derivative to the first term and the second term because they're added together, or in this case, subtracted, but that's, that's adding. Um, and so we take t by dt of 2t squared, and so that pulls one power down, so 2 times 2t, uh, 2 times 2 is 4, and then 2 minus 1 in the power leaves me with 4t. And then for the minus 3t to the minus 1 half, I pull down a minus 1 half power, and so that comes down and it becomes a negative 1 half times 3, becomes plus 3 halves, shows up over here, and then I subtract 1 from the power, that's minus 1 half. Uh, uh, minus 1 is minus uh, 3 halves there. So that's kind of the basics of the mechanics. Let's do some physics. So I can ask the question, what uh, is the average velocity of this particle between t equals 0 and t equals 2 if it follows a trajectory where x is given by this function? You notice all those constants have to have units on them so that they have the same dimensionality. So if time is in seconds, it'll be seconds cubed divided by seconds cubed, leaving behind meters. So that's important. All of these terms have to have the same dimension. That was the last lecture. And so this is the function that we're looking at. We're going to look at the time from, let's go to here, uh, t equals 0 to t equals 2 seconds. And so we can mechanically just kind of look at it and say, that's the line I care about. And then I care about V average is just basically the slope of that line. And I can read this off here. So this is going to be minus four meters minus the, uh, so sorry, let me actually write out the function that I'm calculating here. So this is basically x final minus x initial over t final minus t initial. And so x final there is minus 4 meters. And then x initial is 2 meters, so it's minus 2 meters over final time, which is 2 seconds minus initial time, which is 0 seconds. So that's 4 minus 2 is negative 6 over 2 is going to be negative 3 meters per second. Okay, so uh, that gives us our sort of first uh, uh, view of all this. So the next thing we want to do is actually calculate that as if we were going to use the function itself. So in this case, what we would do is we would actually plug in our two values. We'd have to calculate x final, and we would stick in this function t equals 2 seconds up into here. So we get 2 meters per second cubed times 2 second cubed minus 3 meters per second squared times 2 seconds squared minus 5 meters per second times two seconds plus two meters. So that's the final uh, term. So this is two cubed is eight times two is 16. Uh, negative three times two squared, so that's four. So that's minus 12. Uh, five times two is minus 10 plus two. And these all carry units of meters. The seconds cubed cancel, seconds squared, Seconds cubed cancel, seconds squared cancel, seconds cancel, leaving behind my meters. Uh, and so that's 16 minus 4 minus, uh, is, is 4 minus 10 is um, negative 6 plus 2 is uh, minus 4. Uh, which is what we calculated earlier from the graph, just here. Okay, check. Uh, x initial 
is uh, going to be the same thing. We'll plug in zero. I'm actually not going to go through the details because I note that all of these terms, zero here and here, carry a t. If I plug in t equals zero, they're going to drop out. Uh, so that's just going to leave me with two meters. And so then I just do x final minus x initial over t final minus t initial. And this is the same math that I did earlier, minus four, minus two uh, meters over uh, two seconds, which is minus three meters per second, which is essentially how we would do this if we didn't have a graph and construct it. So the next thing we want to do is to calculate the instantaneous velocity at one second. And this is uh, a little different because it's asking for the calculus. We want, in this case, we want the one second, so that's here, and so that's this point uh, right here. And so we're going to be constructing my tangent line to my curve right like that. Uh, and so that's why I actually have to calculate. It's kind of difficult to see what that value would be initially. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to go straight into the calculus. And so we want to run and calculate d by x by dt. And so that's d by tt of this entire operation. And so what I can apply this to is to use my linear operation rules. So that's d by dt of the 2 meters per second cubed uh, times t cubed minus d by dt of 3 meters per second squared times t squared. Uh, I'm actually going to, um, uh, yeah, so I'll keep going. So minus d by dt of 5 meters per second times t plus d by dt of 2 meters. I'm going to start out with the first uh, one, or the last one, uh, and that is that one rule in calculus is that the time change of a constant is zero, which kind of makes sense. Uh, the uh, graph of d by t, t of x equals 2 meters is just kind of a flat line at 2 meters. If this is t and this is x and this is uh, x equals 2 meters, there's no slope to this line. So this last term here is going to drop out and go to zero. Okay, so that's uh, the first thing. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out my constants, my multiples in front. So I get 2 meters per second cubed comes out. And then I get a d by dt of t cubed minus, same thing here, 3 meters per second squared, d by dt of t squared minus d by, oops, sorry, I uh, got 2 minus 5 meters per second d by dt of t. And then the last term has dropped out. And so then I have to start my operation. So d by dt of t cubed, that goes to 3t squared. Uh, d by dt of t squared, I pull down the 2, leaving 1 behind in the exponent. And so that will go to 2t. And then the time derivative of t to the first is 1 times t to the 0, or just 1. So then that becomes 1. And so this gives me my expression for the velocity. So v of t is just going to be 2 meters per second cubed times, oops, uh, 3t squared. I'm going to actually be do a little surgery here. I'm going to multiply that 3 in, so it becomes 6 meters per second cubed times t squared minus uh, 3, the 3 times the 2 here, and so that's going to be minus uh, 6 meters per second squared times t and then this is just one, so it becomes minus five meters, oops, uh, da, da, five meters per second. Okay, so now we have an expression for our velocity. It's good everywhere, but this just says, uh, why don't you go ahead and plug in t equals one second? So then we evaluate t equals one second. And so then that becomes six meters per second cubed times one second squared minus 6 meters per second squared times 1 second, 
minus five meters per second. And then, so then the neat thing about this is the units cancel out, leaving behind meters per second. Well, that's kind of cool. Uh, it's important to note that when I take the time derivative, it actually is introducing the per second, just like the average velocity. Uh, so it does carry units. So this becomes six meters per second minus six meters per second minus five meters per second. So that means that the velocity at t equals one second is equal to cancel minus five meters per second. And so that says that the slope of this line is five, negative five. Let's point it down. Makes sense. Okay. We done did it. All right. So moving on to calculus, we can also talk about what happens if we want to go the opposite direction? We know the process uh, that velocity, uh, if we know the velocity of a particle and sort of where it starts, we ought to be able to figure out where it ends. And so that is uh, sort of what we're illustrating here. And so if you think about a velocity versus time curve in terms of the initial and the final time, and it's just flat like this, uh, we can actually figure out the um, distance that the particle travels from an initial position, uh, the distance traveled, as, the, uh, as basically the average velocity during this time interval. So I'm going to say that's vi plus vf over 2. It's the average of these velocities if it starts slow and accelerates to be fast, times this time interval, which is the final minus the initial. Uh, so that basically is going to say, all right, I'm going to figure out how far this particle goes from where it started by the average velocity in the time interval times how long it was doing that. And so that's basically saying the, uh, so even if it's changing by a little bit, then uh, this average takes care of that. And so it's just the average times the time interval. Physically, this is interesting because this represents the total distance traveled by the particle uh, in terms of an area. So we look at this curve and the area is the distance that the particle traveled, or if it's small intervals, the displacement uh, that it moves from the initial to the final. And so this shaded part of the curve here geometrically is representing the total distance traveled. And it has the right units. It has a velocity uh, here and a time. And a velocity times a time is a distance. Now, mathematically, we go ahead and represent that you also using the language of calculus. And so what that looks like is by uh, sort of describing the velocity as the height of this curve and the width of this curve as a tiny little interval in time. We write this and we say that the final position is the initial position and then we use this funny little squiggle symbol which we call an integral sign uh, to uh, sort of carry out the sort of area of this curve v over this time interval and we are specific by saying we go from the bottom value ti to the top value which is tf and so we say mathematically we would describe this as the final position is the initial position plus here's the math words the integral of the velocity with respect to time or integral v dt as we often say it, from ti, that's the bottom one, to tf, that's the top one. So that's how we actually describe this mathematically. And we just sort of say, okay, if we actually know where a particle is and how fast it's traveling, we can figure out where it will be in the future. Now, calculus, the second part of uh, calculus, is essentially doing this operation which is to say, well, what if this isn't a nice straight line and I can figure out where my particle is? Instead, what happens if I approximate that line uh, or that curve as a bunch of tiny little straight lines, kind of like you would in derivatives or differential calculus, and then uh, approximate the area, the total area covered, as a limit of a bunch of thinner and thinner rectangles all kind of 
filling up the curve. And so this is kind of representing how we think about this, which is we take a curve and we break it up into a bunch of tiny little segments where things are approximately straight. So that's uh, the, yeah, so that's how we sort of view the um, integral of uh, position uh, when the position or the integral of velocity when the velocity is a curve and not a um, not a straight line. Now the thing that makes this interesting uh, from a calculus perspective is that integrals and derivatives are kind of reverse operations. And go watch those three blue one brown videos to expound this in far more detail than dulcet tones than I would ever be able to present. Uh, but here, uh, the integrals uh, we think about as undoing derivatives because I can take that expression and replace the v with the dx by dt. And so in some very real sense, the dt's kind of cancel and you just add up a bunch of positions of uh, the particle as it moves. Uh, and that gets me to basically the final position is the sum of a bunch of initial positions. I haven't talked much about velocity and acceleration, but it follows a very similar pattern. Vf is Vi plus the integral of the acceleration from the initial to the final time. Uh, and so again, that kind of undoes the time derivative operator that we applied here. And so mechanically, that's kind of what we need to do, uh, which is if I know what this time derivative of a power law is, I bring down a power. Uh, that means that to go the opposite direction, if I'm integrating a power, I bring out the constant. And then what I need to do is I need something that I take a derivative of and I get back to the original function. Uh, and so what that does is it actually adds a power to the exponent. So the time power goes up to n plus 1 if I started with n. And then so when I take the derivative, it all goes away. And we put a 1 over n plus 1 in the denominator. And so the time derivative of the result, a over n plus 1, t to the n plus 1, gets back to my original uh, function. And if we're just going to be careful about where things start and finish, when we carry out this integral, uh, we do a over n plus 1, and then we stick in the final time raised to the n plus 1 power minus the initial time raised to the n plus 1 power. And so that gives me an expression where I can sort of move forward uh, from a velocity to a position or from an acceleration to a velocity. Okay, so that's mechanically what we need to know about calculus. So let's actually do an example that illustrates uh, this here. If I say, if I have a particle's position at V of t, uh, and I have some expression for it, and the particle is uh, at x equals 0 meters at t equals 0 seconds, where's the particle at t equals 3 seconds? So that, what, in terms of calculus, we were using x final is equal to x initial plus the integral from t, t initial to t final of v of t dt. And so we have x initial, uh, which I'm actually, I'll go ahead and substitute in. The x initial is right here. It says that that's zero meters plus the integral. And here the time starts at zero seconds and it finishes over here at Three seconds, and then I plug in my expression for the velocity, which is minus six meters per second cubed t squared plus two meters per second. Uh, all of these dt. And so that means I actually have a linear operation and I have to sort of break it up just like I did with a derivative. And so this becomes zero meters. I could probably, I'm gonna drop that. Zero meters is not gonna matter. So then we get the integral from zero to three seconds. Um, actually, let me pull, I can pull out the coefficients in front. So we get minus six meters per second cubed integral from zero seconds to three seconds of t squared, oh, that's looking good, 
plus 2 meters per second integral from 0 seconds to 3 seconds of dt. So the first one, oops, sorry, t squared dt, and then this one is just 1 dt. So uh, the first case is uh, the integral of t squared. Well, we need something that when we take the derivative of it, uh, we get back to t squared, and the power has to be 1 higher than t squared. So I know that this has to become a t cubed, and then when I take the derivative of t cubed, it's going to bring down a 3, so I need to introduce a 3 in the denominator to cancel that. Minus 6 meters per second cubed. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this with this little vertical bar, which means I'm going to plug in the start and the finish values in a second, 0 seconds and 3 seconds. Okay, so just like that, plus 2 meters per second. And then with a value of one, I need something that when I take the time derivative of it, I just get a constant. And so that's going to be t to the first. And when t to the first takes the derivative, it comes down, it comes t to the zero, and the one comes in the front. So that sounds perfect. So that's going to be a t. And then again, I'm going to use this calculus notation of zero seconds to three seconds. So let's unpack what those vertical bars mean, those sort of evaluations. So that is minus 6 meters per second cubed. And then I'm going to plug in, I plug in 3 seconds cubed over 3. And so that becomes uh, 3 cubed over 3 is 27 over 3 is 9 uh, seconds uh, cubed minus 0 seconds cubed. Okay, that's good. Uh, plus 2 meters per second, and then I plug in 3 seconds minus 0 seconds. Okay, so that becomes minus seconds cubed cancel. So it's minus 54 meters uh, plus 6 meters is equal to minus 54 meters plus 6 meters. Uh, and I can do this as minus 48 meters. So that gives us the position of where it is at t equals uh, 3 seconds. So uh, good on us. We've done, we done a thing. Okay. Um, next up, we want to talk a little bit about constant acceleration. And this is something that should be back in the happy world of physics 20 and physics 30. So um, here, if we take A, the acceleration, to be a constant and work with the calculus, what I can do is I can stick in a constant value and we get just like that last term in the equation that we just solved. Uh, we can basically take this integral of A. A comes out, it's the interval from AT times A times zero, and we get that the velocity at a certain time is just the initial velocity plus at, which is probably an expression you've seen before. Yeah. Uh, similarly, I can take that velocity expression, stick it into my calculus expression for the position here, uh, and if I uh, integrate that up, I get x naught, and then I get the first term, integral v naught t uh, dt, and then the integral of at dt from 0 to t. And I plug in the zeros and all that, and that becomes 1 half a t squared. So that extra, actually, little at integral of t becomes t squared over 2. So that's where that 1 half comes from. So this becomes x naught plus v naught t plus 1 half a t squared. Definitely an expression that you have seen before, but here this follows just from applying those calculus formulas and just carrying out the uh, constant acceleration and just doing a little bit of just doing a little bit of math and outcome those formulas. So it may seem complicated now, but the more you get familiar with calculus, the easier and easier this kind of expression will become. Okay. Uh, finally, I will note that there is one other expression that we use a lot. So if we take our v equals v naught plus a t and we solve it for t, uh, where so t is v minus v naught over a, and then substitute that into our other expression, 
uh, the x naught plus v naught t plus one half a t squared, we get an expression that has no time dependence. We've eliminated it by using this expression. And if I do a little bit of algebra on it, sort of illustrated here, and collect my terms, expand things out, I find that I can solve for the final velocity in terms of the initial velocity squared plus 2a times x minus x naught, which is sort of how far I've moved from my initial position at the constant acceleration. So we'll use this expression an awful lot um, when we sort of need and sort of solve things because it has no time dependence. And if that's not in the problem, we can do those kinematic problems with ease. Okay. So this uh, gives us just a quick exposition of how calculus makes all of those formulas uh, kind of come together uh, from your physics 20 and your physics 30 experiences. Uh, the other thing that you're probably used to that we'll sort of put in a bit of a note about is the idea of free fall. And so free fall is a case of constant acceleration, and it refers to particles that are near the surface of the Earth, or really any planet. Uh, they're near the surface of the Earth. They are falling a distance that is small compared to the radius of the Earth. We can neglect air resistance. We can neglect rotational effects. Then we can treat gravity as providing a constant acceleration downward with a magnitude uh, that's given by the standard constant, which we round to three decimal places as 9.81 meters per second squared, or often in our line of work, we call that a 10. Uh, but anyways, so the, this gives us a constant acceleration. Uh, it has this magnitude of 9.81, and we typically assign it, the, or it defines what the direction of downward is. And if we're defining our plus y direction being up, then we get by applying our constant acceleration formula, we say y is y naught plus v naught, and we use this little extra expression y uh, to indicate that it is the velocity upward in the y direction times t minus one half, there's that g t squared. Now, g can vary from planet to planet that you're on, uh, as long as you're near the surface and there's no air resistance and stuff. Uh, but for Earth, it's this 9.81 meters per second squared. And so this leads to our ability to solve some uh, constant uh, acceleration problems. I'm pretty sure you've done problems like this uh, in the past. And just as an example, a sort of a bit of sort of uh, dragging these things up for your mind, that you could sort of ask a question like this, where we have a case where we have a friend in a hot air balloon that is four meters off the ground. Here's a hot air balloon. It is starting a distance of four meters off the ground. It's not accelerating upward. It is rising upward at a constant speed. We'll call it V0B of uh, two meters per second. And there, your friend has forgotten their lunch. So you, being a, a real pal, throw the sandwich upward uh, to them at a speed of V0S, which is equal to 13 meters per second. You are quite the sandwich thrower, it turns out. And we want to know what are two possible times at which the sandwich can be caught from, by your friend, assuming you're right underneath it. Uh, we're going to define the plus y direction to be upward, and we're going to treat this as a one-dimensional problem. Sandwich flying upward to hit balloon and get caught by your friend. And in both of these cases, we are treating the, K, uh, the, the problem in terms of a one-dimensional uh, problem with the basic constant acceleration uh, uh, parameters. And here we can write down the position for your friend. We'll say your friend is equal to the initial position for your friend. Oh, I've called it balloon. Let me call it balloon again. You know, why balloon is the initial position for the balloon plus the initial speed for the balloon plus one half times the acceleration of the balloon t squared. More on that. And then I will note that we have a constant speed rising upward of two meters per second. So that means that the acceleration is zero. And so that's our complete expression where y naught of the balloon is 4.0 meters and we have v naught for the balloon is equal to 2.0 meters per second.
Now I should note uh, at this point that I'm using a lot of these subscripts here. Uh, and the subscripts are just ways of giving variables different names. Things in the exponents, like that square there, those are mathematically important. Anything that's in a subscript down here, I don't care about. It's just a way of giving a variable a different name. So don't worry about the mathematics of it later until like, I don't know, third year electricity and magnetism when suddenly math appears in the subscript position. It's, it'll be worth it, trust me. Um, okay, so returning to uh, the problem at hand, this was the expression for the balloon. Then we can write down a similar expression for the sandwich. So y naught sandwich plus v naught sandwich uh, times t minus one half g t squared. And I've adopted this form because as soon as the sandwich leaves your hand, it is subject to the whimsy of gravity and gravity in a free fall problem starts to pull things down with an acceleration of g downward uh, here. And I've ascribed a minus sign here to the acceleration term because I have already defined my plus y direction going upward. So that means uh, I can look through all this. I am going to set the y not sandwich to be zero because you're throwing the sandwich from ground level upward. But I do know that the initial speed for that sandwich, v not sandwich, is 13 meters per second. And then g is g. And so the criterion for your friend catching the sandwich is that the balloon is at the same height as the sandwich. So we just equate these two expressions. We say y naught balloon plus v naught balloon t is equal to uh, v naught sandwich t minus one half g t squared. And here it's all over but the algebra. We've done, we've done the physics. Now we have to solve for t. So I'm going to collect all terms on one side of the equation. So it has a zero on the other side of the equation. So this becomes one half g t squared uh, plus, oops, let's make that into an actual plus sign, v naught b minus v naught s times t, uh, okay, okay, uh, plus y naught b is equal to zero. So I've pulled everything to the left-hand side of the equation here. Uh, changing signs as appropriate. And now this is a quadratic. So we can apply the quadratic formula, which is negative b, so that's going to be v naught sandwich minus v naught balloon, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is v naught balloon minus v naught sandwich squared, minus four times a, which is g over two, times c, which is y naught of the balloon, all, oops, all over 2a, where a is a half g, so that's just going to be over g. So let's plug in some numbers. The speed of the sandwich is 13, the speed of the balloon is 2, so this is 11 meters per second, plus or minus the square root of uh, negative 11 meters per second squared minus 4 times 5 meters per second squared times the initial height of the balloon, which is 4 meters. Uh, and then we're all going to divide by uh, g, which is just 10 meters per second squared. I'm going to sneak up here in my algebra, try not to go to another page here. So this is uh, in uh, meters per second over meters per second squared, leaves with me with units of seconds. And so we have t is equal to 11 plus or minus the square root of 121 minus four times five is 20 times four is 80, all over 10. Uh, which is uh, square root of four, 11 plus or minus square root of 41 over 10 seconds. This is also seconds. And so in terms of uh, actual calculations, we can pop that out as 1.74 seconds and 0.45 seconds. So 
We have two roots to the equation. Both of them make sense. They're both positive numbers. They happen after you throw. And so this corresponds to uh, two scenarios. Your friend either is going to catch the sandwich uh, here. So the either you're going to take the sandwich. Your friend is moving upward here. And the sandwich is going to get caught by your friend as it's going up, or the sandwich is going to go up, cross its apex, uh, and start falling back down, and your friend is going to rise up and uh, catch it there, going the opposite direction. So those are what the two roots of this expression correspond to, and therefore give you your two values of 1.74 and 0 0.75, 0 0.45 seconds. Okay. So, I want to say one final thing before letting you go forth into the wonderful world of of multi uh, of one dimensional kinematics. And that is, there's sometimes math is going to ask you to take some complicated functions and then take a derivative of them, like this function here, x of t is sine of b times t cubed. This will be a little while before this happens in this class, but I'm just warning you that this is something that's coming forward. And mathematicians like to view this as what we call a composition of two functions, where there's a f of t that's just sine of t, and then g of t, which is just like b times t cubed. And then you can cut, represent that x up there as f of g of t. So it's a composition. Uh, you do a function, then you do another function. And calculus gives us a special rule for these composition of functions, which is called the chain rule. Uh, and so if you have the derivative of two functions, you first take the derivative of the inner function with respect to the original value. value dg by dt, and then you multiply it by taking the derivative of the outer function by whatever its variable is, uh, so whatever is getting plugged into from g. So we write that as df by dg. And so in this case, uh, we write, you know, sine of bt cubed. Uh, we say first we will take a derivative of d by dg of sine of this g, whatever it is coming out of the g function. And you may or may not know this, but the derivative of a sine function is cosine. Kind of cool. Uh, and so then it's the cosine of g of t. And so we can just plug in b t cubed. So that's the first term. And then I take the derivative of dg by dt in terms of bt cubed. So this is uh, just becomes a function that we know, which is 3bt squared. The power comes down, subtract 1 from the power, that gives us this. And so we can take our overall function as 3bt squared times cos bd cubed. So we basically multiply these two results together. There's no reason why you should believe me on that right now. But I want to bank something. And that is, in physics, we can kind of view the acceleration as dv by dt. That's no form. But if we had b as a function of x, for some reason we knew how fast something was moving based on where it was, we, would have, we could write this expression as dv by dx times dx by dt and view it as a chain rule function. And so then... I would write dv by dx, but then dx by dt, that's a thing we know. That's just v. That's the velocity here. And so we get an expression that the acceleration is dv by dx times v, or, and you can sort of do this in math, they, they hate it, but it's, you know, 10 tricks that uh, mathematicians hate that you know, is you actually bring the dx up here. And so we'll have a nice little expression that says that a dx is equal to v dv. And I don't expect you to believe me or, try, uh, you know, sort of intuit that or anything until we get farther into calculus. But this little nugget's going to allow us to solve some really amazing problems. So this is an investment in the future. And with that investment in the future, 
I think we're done for the day. So let's call it uh, let's call it the end of uh, 1D kinematics. At this point, uh, go ahead and work on your content quiz. Answer any questions that you uh, ask, any questions, things you'd like to do more of, and then we'll actually really dive into and get more comfortable with this material as we go into class. All right, thanks for listening. I'll talk to you in class.